Now let's look at recursion. And if you haven't seen recursion before, this is a topic that typically takes a few times looking at this for it to really start to click. So what is recursion? My favorite definition of recursion is that it is a function that calls itself until it doesn't. So now let's look at a very common example that is used to explain recursion. I'm going to bring up a gift box here. And we need to open the gift box. And the way we open gift boxes is with the open gift box function. And when we run the open gift box function, it's going to return either a ball in this case, or it's going to contain a smaller gift box. And if it's a smaller gift box, the way we open gift boxes is with the open gift box function. So we'll run that again. And when we do, that gift box is either going to contain the ball or it will contain a new, smaller gift box. So now we're going to run the open gift box function again. And in this case, we'll just say that we found the ball. Okay, so now let's put this back and we'll look at some code. Now I want to emphasize this is pseudocode. This is not code that will actually run. It's just for example. So we're going to create our function open gift box. And we're going to say if when we open the box, it contains a ball. So if ball, we will return that ball. Otherwise, it's a gift box in which case we need to run the open gift box function. And this is where the function calls itself. So there are a couple of things about recursion that are very important. First, the process of opening each new box is the same. Or the process of whatever we're doing with recursion has to be the same. The other key point is each time we open a box, we make the problem smaller. So now let's walk through this code with our boxes. So we'll say open gift box. And when we do, we'll check to see, is this a ball? In this case, it's not. So we have to run the open gift box function again. So it calls itself. So this is a second instance of the function that we're putting on the call stack. And we'll talk about call stacks further in the next video. So then we're going to check to see if this box contains a ball. It does not. So we have to run another instance of open gift box. This is going to call itself again. So now we run another instance of the function. Now, when we check to see if it's a ball, it is a ball. And because this is a return, we will not run this line of code and we stop having the function call itself because we have this return method here. So you have to have this in your recursive function. So now let's put this back again and talk about a couple of concepts here. When we open this box and it contains the ball, this is what we call our base case. This is when we are going to stop opening boxes or the function will stop calling itself. If it needs to call itself again, this is called a recursive case. This is also a recursive case. And this is the base case. Let's bring our code back in here. When this if statement is true, that is our base case. And it's very important to have this because if you don't, we'll remove this, the function gets called, and then it calls itself, which creates another instance of the function, and that's going to call itself, and then we create another instance of the function, and so on. And this will create what is known as a stack overflow. So you have to have a base case where this will, at some point, stop calling itself. And there are a couple of things about this that are very important. First, this if statement has to be true at some point. So you can't have something like this. Because one is never greater than two. This will never be true. 
and you will loop through this infinitely and create a stack overflow. And you might be saying, well, that's pretty obvious that one is never going to be greater than two. But sometimes we have if statements in our code that are very complicated, and it's not obvious that the if statement is not going to ever be true. So if you get a stack overflow in a recursive function, this is one of the places to go troubleshoot. So let's put this back. The other thing is that you have to have a return statement. If you have something like this that doesn't return anything, the if statement becomes true, you print hello world, and because it is not a return statement that causes us to stop running code, it just goes right to the next line, and we go right back into our loop and have a stack overflow. So it's very important that you have the return statement in your code. And that is our quick overview of recursion. So now the next thing we're going to look at is the call stack. And I'm going to start out explaining the call stack with functions that are not recursive. Then in the next video, we're going to look at how recursive functions go on the call stack. And the reason for that is because it's a lot easier to understand what is happening on the call stack first non-recursive functions. So earlier in the course, we looked at a data structure called a stack, and we used the analogy of it being like a can of tennis balls. That all applies here as well. So whatever function is at the top of the call stack is the only one that can run. Once that function is done running and you remove it, then the next function can run. And when it is complete, that'll be removed, and then the next function can be run until that one is complete. So let's take this frame here and move it over, and we're going to use this for a call stack. So let's say we have a simple function called function1, and all it does is print out a string that says 1. Function1, when you call it, will be put on the call stack. It will print out that string, and once it's done running, we'll remove this from the call stack. So let's bring this back and look at something a little bit more complex. Let's say that function one, before it prints out this string, calls function two. When function one calls function two, function two gets pushed on to the call stack. But let's say function two is going to call function three. That will cause function three to get pushed onto the call stack. And then we'll say that function three doesn't call any other functions. It's just going to print out the string three. So this gets printed out like this. And once it does that, function three is done running. And we can pop that from the call stack. And now function two is at the top of the call stack again. Function two was waiting for function three to finish before it could go to the next line in function two. So now function two can print out the string two. And once it does that, we can pop function two from the call stack. And function one was waiting for function two to finish before it could run this line of code and print out the string one. And once that's done, function one can be popped from the call stack. So notice that we call these functions in the order of one, two, three, but it printed out 321 because 321 is the order that these came off of the call stack. So let's bring this code up here again and let's go look at this code in VS Code. So there are the three functions there and this is where we call function one to kick all of this off. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna come up here to this button here that says run and debug when I hover over this. I'm going to click on this. It'll bring up this side window here. And then over on this side, there are the three dots here that say additional views. I'm going to click on this and I'm going to choose debug console. Just like that. And then in the middle here where it says function one, next to the line number, you can see that I get a red dot when I hover here, but when I click, that becomes a bright red dot. That's going to create 
a breakpoint. And you can see that down here. And you can see the line number 13 is where that breakpoint is. So I'm going to shrink this down. And then up here we have variables. I'm going to close that and watch. I'm going to close that. And we're just going to focus on call stack here. And where it says run and debug up here, make sure it says Python current file. If you pull down on this, there can be other things that you can choose. Just make sure Python current file is chosen. And next to that, we have the green play button. I'm going to click on this. You can see that function one, where we created our breakpoint, is highlighted. That will be the next line of code that will be run. And if you come up here to the top, there's a downward pointing arrow here, and it says step into. This is what I'm going to use to step through this code one line at a time. And then we can see how everything is going on in the call stack and how it's going to print out. So when I click on this, this will call function one and add it to the call stack. So I'm going to click on it. And you can see over here that function one is on the call stack. And now we're running the code in function one. The first thing function one does is call function two. So I'm going to click on this. And now function two has been added to the call stack. And the first thing that function two does is it calls function three. So I'll click on it again. And now function three has been added to the call stack. So you can see up here that print the string three is highlighted. So when I click on this button again, it's going to do two things. It's going to print out the string three, and then function three is going to be popped from the call stack over here. So I'm going to click on this. And function three has been popped from the call stack, and three has been printed out. Function two is waiting for function three to complete for it to move to the next line of code where it says print two. And when this runs, two is going to be printed out to the console, and function two will be popped from the call stack like that. Function one was waiting for function two to finish before I could move on to the next line and print out the string one. And when I click on this again, one will be printed out and function one will be popped from the call stack. So I'll do that now. And now we have three, two, one over here in our debug console. And our call stack no longer has any of those three functions. All right, and that is our overview of the call stack. So now we're going to use recursion to solve a factorial. And factorial is something that is used to teach recursion in pretty much any course that teaches recursion. And if you've never seen a factorial before, it looks like this. This is 4 factorial. And 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So I'm going to shrink this down like this and... Let's walk through why this is a perfect thing to use to teach recursion. So 3 times 2 times 1 would be equal to 3 factorial. So you could say that 4 factorial is equal to 4 times 3 factorial. And you could say that 3 factorial is equal to 3 times 2 factorial. And 2 factorial is equal to... 2 times 1 factorial, and 1 factorial, well, this is our base case, so this one's going to be different. 1 factorial is just going to be 1. A couple of videos ago, we talked about a couple of things that you need to have in a recursive function. The first is that you need to be doing the same thing over and over. And you can see that this process is the same all the way down. The other thing is that the problem needs to be getting smaller until you finally get to a base case. So this is perfect. So I'm going to shrink this down. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring in the entire function, and then we'll walk through it. So this is our recursive function for factorial. We're going to pass this a number in. 
in this case, we're going to pass it the number 4. Then we're going to check to see if n is equal to 1. When we get to the point where n is 1, we're going to return 1. If n is not equal to 1, we'll come down to this line here where we return n times factorial of n minus 1. So this is where the function calls itself. So in this first iteration, it would look like this. We're going to return n, which is 4, times factorial of n minus 1, n minus 1 would be 3. So let's move this function up to the corner like this, and we'll walk through this. So first we have factorial of n, n is equal to 4 to begin with. And we'll say, is n equal to 1? Well, obviously it's equal to 4, so it's not 1. So we will return n times factorial of n minus 1. So we can do this, and we'll populate that with 4 and 3. So now we are calling the function with n being equal to 3. So when we run our if, is n equal to 1? It is not. So that causes us to run this line here. And this is going to be 3 and 2 this time. So we're running factorial on 2. So now our if statement is n equal to 1. It's not. So we have to run this line again. And now we're going to use 2 and 1. So we're running factorial on 1. So now when we say if n equals 1, it is going to be true. And we're going to return 1. That is this 1 here. So now let's just look at these lines here. Let's spread these out. And when we return the 1, we're returning the 1 to this function call here. And then we're going to return 2 times factorial 1 to this function call, and so on up the line until we return the answer to this line here. So let's walk through what this is going to look like. So when we return 1 there, we're returning 2 times 1, which equals 2, up to here. Now we're going to return 3 times 2, which equals 6, up to here. Now we're going to return 4 times 6, which equals 24, up to here. And factorial of 4 equals 24. So now let's look at this a different way. Let's use the gift boxes that we used a couple of videos ago. So we start out with this being factorial of 4, then 3, and 2, and 1. And in the gift box video, we had a ball when we reached our base case, but now this is going to be a 1. And then 1 gets returned to this function call, and then we have 2 times 1 is 2 gets returned to this function call. 3 times 2 is 6, like that. And then finally we get to the 24. And now let's look at this yet another way with our call stack. We start out with factorial 4. That goes on to the call stack first. Then we have factorial 3 gets pushed onto the call stack. And then 2 gets pushed onto the call stack. And then 1 gets pushed onto the call stack like this. And it's only that last instance of the factorial function that can run because it's at the top of the call stack. So we'll remove that, and then we can calculate the next one like this, and so on, until we get to here, and then we return the 24. So now let's go look at this in VS Code. So there is our factorial function there, and then we'll call it here, factorial 4, and print out the result. And just like we did in the last video, we're going to come up here and open this run and debug side window like that. And then over here, we're going to click on the three dots, and we're going to choose the debug console, and next to this line, we're going to 
click the red dot, highlight that to create a breakpoint. Up here for run and debug, we want Python current file to be here. And if it's not, do the little drop down menu, make sure that's selected. And we'll click on the green play button. And now we can walk through this step by step. So now when I click on the step into, it's going to run factorial, the factorial function with a value of four. And that gets pushed onto the call stack. It's going to check to see if n is equal to one. And obviously it is not. So it's going to come down here. And when I click on this again, it's going to push factorial onto the call stack again, this time with the number three. So notice that both functions on the call stack are named factorial. And that's why I did the call stack video I did in the last video. It's easier to keep track of this and kind of see what's happening when the items on the call stack are called function one, function two, function three. In a recursive function, it's just going to be called factorial because it's calling itself. But these are distinct instances of factorial. So I'm going to come up here and we'll step into this again. The if statement is going to be false because n is not equal to one. We'll come down here. And now we're going to get another factorial pushed onto the call stack over here. You can see we have three of them now. This latest one is with the number two. n is still not equal to one. So we're going to come down here again. And now it's going to get pushed onto the call stack with the number one. Now we have four factorials on the call stack. But this time, n is equal to one. So we come down to the return one here. And when it returns that one, it's going to pop one of those factorials off of the call stack. So I'm going to click on this. And you can see that we only have three factorial functions on the call stack now. And as I showed before in the animations, it's returning it here. It is returning it to where this was called with the number two. So when I click on this, that's going to get popped from the call stack. And this is going to be with the number three. And with the number four, this will be the final one that gets popped off the call stack. And it's going to return that value to here. And so for this last one, I'm going to move over from the step into a couple of buttons over to where it says continue. And when you click on, click on this, it'll just run the rest of the code. And I'm going to do this because there's a message that will pop up otherwise. So I'm going to click on this and you can see that we have the number 24 that's been returned. And that is our recursive function for factorial.